Okay, thanks for that. So yeah, uh, as the slide sort of says, I'm here to talk about the bus plan and how it affects junior staff training, uh, particularly around automation is my concern. Uh, my concern mostly is the fact that staff are coming in to the business um, at all levels across various different industries where automation is the focus. And they come in saying automation is the best, but if we go to them going, how do we do this without automation because puppet master's down, something's broken. You know, it takes time to push it through your automation. Can they do it? It's a new amount of time, the answer is, yeah, maybe. <laughs> which is a little bit worrying. Uh, so yeah, just a quick sorry, who are we? Uh, Andrew Jeffrey uh, was already on the other slide, but just to sort of reinforce it, please contact security, if, well, I think that's me, yes. Um, I'm a solutions engineer at Anchor Systems in Sydney. Uh, we're a managed service provider, mostly focusing around Amazon Web Services, and we do a lot of custom bespoke solutions for customers, so everything's a little bit different. Uh, just a quick disclaimer, views are mine, not my employers. They sent me here though, so I'll let you take that. <laughs> so why am I giving the talk? As part of what I said earlier, uh, the concern is that the staff are coming in only thinking about automation. They come in, they go, I've played with Puppet. I've played with Ansible. And when you dig into that a bit deeper, it's like, yep, cool. I downloaded a playbook from Ansible Galaxy and I ran it. Okay, but can you do what that playbook does manually? Do you understand it? Did you verify where it came from? Did you do anything else that's necessary for it to work? Um, or did you just download it and run it? Is essentially my main concern. And the main reason I'm coming across it is we're trying to solve that problem my employer. And we're starting to bring people up through some slightly different methods to have the awareness to be able to do things without that or before you have to get the automation involved. So the bus plan, uh, who here has heard of the bus plan or is familiar with the phrasing bus plan, bus factor? You know, yeah, that half, okay. So it's essentially a measurement of risk resulting from departure or sudden vanishing of staff from both an information perspective and a capabilities perspective. So information is documentation. Lots of people have covered that today. I'm talking about capabilities in terms of their skill sets. Do they actually have the skills and knowledge to actually execute on your documentation? Because if you give them documentation saying, here's a pacemaker cluster, run all these commands, if they don't know what pacemaker is, there's some problems. <laughs> so just a quick disclaimer, again, another no, it's a second disclaimer, it's a bad sign. Uh, automation isn't bad, I don't dislike automation. I write automation for a living extensively in my day-to-day -day job. I use three or four different automation technologies on a daily basis. Um, but in this particular situation, yeah, I don't know how that clicks back on. So, that works. Oh, no, I figured it out, I think. Staying, yes, good. Okay, uh, so yeah, I use Puppet, Ansible, and Terraform along with a collection of custom tooling uh, that we use at our work. So quite a bit of random automation, quite a lot of different ones. So automation I know is a pretty broad term. I broke it up into sort of four little sections here. I know it's still pretty broad, but just to mostly help focus on what we're gonna talk about. I mostly talk about configuration management and infrastructure as code today. Uh, custom tooling, it's got its own sort of side effects. They all do, they're pretty common. Uh, how many of you use automation in some form? Puppet, Chef, Ansible, infrastructure as code, CI CD pipelines, and how many of you have lots of random custom scripts and tools you've written internally that, do, that are kind of automation-like anyway? You know, they run via cron, it's automated, cron's automated, it's automation. <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll get there, I'll, I can argue that point to death. Um, right, so in this situation, since I can't use actual code samples, uh, automation's got lots of buttons. Lots and lots of buttons. So that picture is a ballast control panel on a nuclear submarine. Um, so if you press the wrong button or the wrong combinations of buttons, you're going to have a fun time. Um, you know, things could work. The wrong thing could happen. Nothing could happen. It could throw a weird error that you then have to go look up in probably a book that's yay thick printed in paper. Um, so 
you need to understand not just what the button is labeled to do, but what behind the scenes is happening when you push the button or you change those values in your automation. It's particularly important when you get into situations where the button doesn't exist, or in this case, wasn't actually implemented, as you can see there. <laughs> you know, great. I've gone, right. So I went to use that functionality for a customer. It's not there. <laughs> was the scenario that I got given by a junior staff member who came to me. So it's, it's there, it just says, to be added later. <laughs> it was literally the entire file, and uh, later on I found out I'd written that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> the first comment was, oh, who would write that? That's not me, it's not me. Surely it wouldn't be me. It was me. Um, so yeah, in this case, the scenario is, okay, the button's not there. Do they have the understanding? Sure, you can copy code that does similar things, but you don't know what you need to do. How do you understand what needs to change? Or if you need to add something completely new, in this case, you know, there's functions for opening the doors. There's no function for closing the doors. You, know, you can extrapolate some of the logic you need from the functions that open the doors, I'd hope. Uh, but what if we need to make the doors open or close in a different direction? Just to be weird, because customers ask for weird things. <laughs> so in this scenario, they need to have played ideally with the doors in the scenario, manually in some aspect, without hurting themselves, because <laughs> that would be somewhat dangerous in an elevator. Uh, so if they play with it without using the automation, they're going to have a better concept and understanding of where they need to go look to be able to implement those changes to make the fixes. Otherwise, they're going to spend a lot longer writing the automation and then probably fixing the automation multiple times over the next couple of months or weeks, uh, depending on what the scenario is and what, how badly it is. Because they'll add the initial thing, they'll go, great, I can use it elsewhere. Ah, now it needs this feature, and this feature, and this feature, and this feature. Then you rent back up to pretty much, you've got one button, and it's doing about six different things. What if it stops halfway through? What do you do if it doesn't return anything? Did it work? How do I tell? How do we deal with that? So mostly the solution is do it the manual way. So the key process for me is we deal with a lot of web hosting uh, at Anchor. So we have Apache, Nginx is the main two web servers we use. Every customer is slightly different. The main issue you get is that the configurations are very different per customer. And sometimes we add options that we've never used before. And if I go to junior staff and we go, how do you add this option? And they go, well, I can just add the option and pop it. Great, the option's not there. It's new function, new feature, it's only been released just now. How do we go around that? So what we do is we train them. So the way I've been doing training, this is something that we're still in the process of doing, is we start out with a virtual server that is completely blank. There's no automation on it, there's nothing like that. We literally give them very vague instructions. Install WordPress was the instruction I gave. I, I don't care what web server you use, database, you know, anything like that, I, I, I'm not fast. Get WordPress up and document your steps on the blog that you're running in WordPress. After you've done that, then we start playing with it. Then we start extending things. Okay, add SSL. What if I want to have multiple WordPress sites? How does that change your setup? What if I need to add caching? What if I need to move the database to a separate server? How do I make it highly available? We start expanding upon it. We tweak it, we change it, we log in, we break things, and Sometimes we delete things. Do they have backups? It's one way to find out. <laughs> Since it's all a training exercise, it's perfectly safe to do that. <laughs> uh, that's the main idea we're trying to get across, is that you should not be afraid of touching things manually, especially in complex environments, because in a lot of cases, making the change via your automation or an automated process will take a very long time, or may not necessarily be something you can achieve at this present state with your skill set. 
you're, you may need to put the fix in manually to test if it works even. So we go through that, we build through the entire environment, we test it all, and we just keep expanding on it. And I've actually hit it at 10 minutes. Wow, that's what I get for not rehearsing. <laughs> No, no, I'm saying I'm done. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, oh, I expected that. Yeah. Questions, please. So it, um, it sounded like you were describing uh, sort of a, a series of training plans for your junior staff members when you're talking about starting with a simple little server yes. and then add feature X, feature Y. Do you have any process to um, decide on what that end state is? Do you take a look at what your infrastructure looks like, say, I, I want this to be my end state for whatever they build, so what's the simplest thing I can start with? Somewhat, yes. Um, since we tend to do a large portion of what we do is web hosting. Uh, it's usually sort of the website's the key focus, and it's just mostly expanding it to make it highly available and then adding different things. You get, like I said, WordPress was the initial scenario, but what if it's a Ruby app? You know, you get there's tons of scenarios out there on how to set up WordPress with you know, PHP FPM. There's a fair few scenarios about setting up Ruby or Python. Um, it's a completely different sort of kettle of fish, though, because the way things work is different, and they have to sort of change things, okay, the customer's actually come back and said, oops, we're not actually using WordPress, we're now using Ruby. What do you need to change? How do you change it? What do you say to the customer in the situation? We're, we're training for multiple purposes, not just a technical one. Uh, with your junior staff and like um, inducting them, like what kind of percentage of like real work and training work do you split up? Uh, it sort of varies depending on all sorts of uh, variables. Uh, mostly it's probably about a 30-70 split, um, so 30% training, 70% sort of real work. Uh, we try and include actual work as training within reason as long as it's sort of carefully reviewed and sort of mentored and someone's there stepping them sort of through the process. Uh, so yeah, as for their actual sort of obstacle course stuff um, like this, it's usually sort of, you can work on it a bit during the hours, you can also play with it after hours if you want to do other weird stuff outside of what we've sort of asked you to do. You know, it's not set in stone that you have to just do those things. If you want to play with something else, you can play with something else. You know, we sort of want to enable them to be able to learn and uh, extend their knowledge with systems that we may not be familiar with. Do you transition in your training from doing it manually to doing it automated? And how do you, if so, how do you decide when to do that transition? Yeah, uh, so we do. Uh, what we do is it starts out actually using Ansible, and we sort of work the way up to Puppet and scripting and various things like that, sort of in the middle of it. So the initial sort of virtual server build with just WordPress on it, once they've got that up, They've got some backups. It's then a situation of let's do, okay, cool. I've blown all the way. You've got a backup. I want you to rebuild it. Write Ansible to rebuild it. And then when it comes to sort of a clustered solution, we start working towards sort of Ansible or even Puppet, depending on the scenario. And sort of, we, eventually, since we use Puppet as our main automation technology, we do end up using Puppet uh, in the end result. Um, do you have like a preset training plan that you know you go through with the staff that you induct, or um, is it just sort of you know whoever's training on the day, what they come up with to train them? And if you have a training plan, um, how do you you know who does the task of actually making up those training plans? Sorry, I missed the last bit of that. Um, if you have a training plan, yep. Who makes up who makes up those training plans? Uh, as to who makes them up. Uh me, along with my co colleagues, um, we sort of look at where we need to go, where the weaknesses are in the team, um, what sort of we might be pursuing in the future from a business perspective of you know, technologies we might be deploying, um, or technologies that we're not using much but we expect to grow, or technologies that 
there isn't much of it left, but it's one of the more fiddly ones and they need to be aware of it. Hi. Do you train one-on-one -on -one or in small groups or what is the preferred approach? Uh, I prefer one-on-one -on -one, um, because everyone learns differently, has different questions, and inevitably with it being Linux within reason, you encounter different issues depending on whatever's happened. <laughs> One thing I've noticed is that um, people, like I'm familiar with the configuration management we use, but other people aren't, so they tend to try and avoid it. Do you have any tips for making it safe for them to play with without breaking stuff in production and or just introducing them so they can become more familiar? And yeah. I guess it's that transition from doing it manually. How do you do that, I guess? Yeah. Um, so our puppet is very unique, I think would be the word. Um, it's, uh, uh, it's uh, several uh, tens of thousands of lines diverge from mainstream Puppet, um, from the actual Puppet agent and everything like that, just due to changes we've made for our various reasons. Um, the way we use it is a bit non-standard. In terms of getting them into it, we've got a lot of uh, linting that happens both on the client side and on the Puppet Master before everything gets rolled out. That certainly helps. Um, some of the other changes we've made in terms of those you know, tens of thousands of lines of difference in mainstream is that we have added a lot of sort of sanity checking into places that doesn't allow you, for example, install MySQL across your entire sort of infrastructure if you leave it you know, outside the wrong set of brackets. Um, so yeah, we sort of ease them into it mostly with a non-custom version of Puppet, I guess, to try and get them to understand the sort of principles of it that aren't necessarily the ways we do it because we're not always of the opinion that everything we do is the best way to do it, because practices change, and you know, if our practices work for us, we're not likely to change them within reason. We don't want them to be stuck in the mindset that everything we do is the right answer 100% of the time. Excellent. Um, well, thank you very much. Please join me in thanking one last time. <laughs>